What if you could learn from physical product entrepreneurs that have risen up from the trenches to dominating their market by creating successful physical product brands? Well, this podcast is hosted by me, Kanye Campbell, and it's about breaking the mold to becoming a smarter, savvier, and better product entrepreneur. You discover how to take physical products from concept food launch and to scaling up from physical product entrepreneurs who've taken their revolutionary ideas to 1 million, 10 million, and 50 million plus in revenue businesses. You'll also join me in my journey to build a million dollar physical product brand business in a year where we both will learn about crowdfunding selling to retail chains launching through marketplaces like amazon strategic partnerships publicity celebrity endorsements and selling direct to consumers so if you're creating or building a brand in the consumer packaged goods space in fashion and apparel business products or any physical product niche listen in because we have you covered join the fast track to physical product business success this is the physical product business podcast I'm Kune Campbell. Let's get rolling. With retail moving online, finding a good domain name has become ever so important. But the challenge is that most decent.com addresses are either difficult to acquire or unavailable. The good news is that retailers now have a powerful alternative with the .store domain name. A .store domain name will be short, relevant, and directly associate your site with e-commerce and retail. Search engines give .store domains the equal attention and importance as .com TLDs. Dot store domains have already been adapted by top brands such as Emirates. So if you check out Emirates.store, you get to a store there. Jimi Hendrix, so Jimi Hendrix.store and F1 Formula One, F1.store. If you want a short and snappy domain name for your retail brand or your online store, you can now get a dot store domain for just £4.99, which is about $6.99 using the coupon code 2 x Store. That's 2XSTORE on get.store. So just go to get.store in your search engines and use 2X Store. This episode is brought to you by Clavio. It is a game changing email automation tool specifically built for scaling e commerce businesses. I'm not just saying it, I use Clavio in my e commerce store and stores are advice for. Household names in the e-commerce space such as Brooklyn Inn, Bonobos and Chobis use Clavio. Here's why. Clavio has one of the most impressive feature sets in the e-commerce email personalization space at the moment. Besides the one-click setup, Clavio's Pixel tracks visitor behavior to help you set up highly effective custom email funnels. Clavio also offers pre-built autoresponders for cart abandonment, upsells, and win-back campaigns. Clavio's most game-changing feature is its Facebook audiences integration, which helps your email list to sync up with your Facebook ad campaigns. So as you continue to scale up your store, Clavio will help automate a lot more sales. Try Clavio today on Clavio.com, spelt K-L-A-V-I-Y-O.com. Hi guys, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast, the podcast where you learn from entrepreneurs and e-commerce marketing experts on how to grow your e-commerce businesses. Um, I just have one thing, one promise to you, if from what you learn here you could 2x one metric i'm satisfied i'll keep on recording now on this episode i'm joined by gentleman an ex marine turned entrepreneur who got into a family business and has managed to scale their business into eight figures over a decade and it's been they've been ups and downs in their business um, from selling other people's brands, which I don't exactly um, support every time to actually owning their private label brand. Um, and yeah, so I've had an initial discussion with him and it's it's an amazing business you know they're growing they're more into the gaming in terms of like recreational gaming space um and um the the name of the website is called dazadi.com we're going to talk a lot and a lot and a lot about you know many aspects of building um an eight figure business i'm talking about a, a 10 million plus business the intricacies of it so um if you are 
you know, listening and you want to find more, just keep on listening. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jason Boyce to the show. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Kumai. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Jason, I haven't done you justice with the introduction. Could you take a minute or two to just introduce yourself and then we, we, we kick things off? Oh, well, there's so many questions I want to ask um, from here. I was meaning to ask you, was the adoption ever official or did it just... No, it was not official. I still have a very loving biological family. Okay. And I'm, you know, of course, very connected to you. But uh, I was away, you know, for college and flunking out of college. Wow. And the Clarissenfeld family just kind of took me in. And, wow. Uh, I adopted them, I think, more than they adopted me. Wow. Wow. Um, and then, and, and they, yeah, they, I literally, when I introduce uh, my brothers, or they introduce me, we introduce our, each other as brothers. Oh, that's so deep. Related, yeah. So well, well. <laughs> Yeah. So you, yeah, in in your low, you 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 bonded, and um, yeah, it, it's it's solid. It's it's rock solid, right? Um, so so that's really inspiring. Um, off the back of you know the intimate times you had, you know, building a business off the back of it. Um, when did you? When did the penny you know drop to make the decision as to selling? you know, um, gaming equipment, you know, and games, you know, online. Did you even start online? We did. We started online entirely um, okay. in the year 2002. Okay. I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps, and we sat down at that family dinner table that I had so many uh, family dinners and lunches with over the years, and yep. we decided that we wanted to start a business. And it, it just made perfect sense to us that we would offer the same kinds of products like basketball hoops and mm. table tennis tables and foosball and, and backgammon and board games that yeah. we used to bond as brothers. Mm. It just was a natural fit for us. And I think we started with just basketball hoops, but we always had the intention to expand into the categories. Okay. How did you get the basketball hoops? Oh, it's a great question. We started pure dropship. Okay. So we just called everyone in America that manufactured basketball hoops. Let them tell us no as many times as they need to until they got to yes. <laughs> and, and it only took one. You know, by the time we got one manufacturer to say yes, you know, we launched the website. Uh, we started to build it back in. My, my younger brother, Josh, who's still uh, he's the CEO of the company, also a okay. co-founder, he was a junior in high school. Okay. He, he designed and developed our first back end, uh, wow. front end of the website. What did he run on at the time? What was that? What did it run on technology-wise at the time? Oh, I believe it was all PHP and MySQL, which oh, wow. ironically we're still running on, but they're light years ahead of where they were when we first started. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And were you, you'd, you'd, grad, you'd just come back from the Marines at the time. You'd yeah. graduated four years in the Marines and then you started out a, a business. What about your your military background? You know, being a marine, how did it impact on taking risk? Oh well, there's no better training than Marine Corps training for taking risk. Uh, 
uh, calculated risk. Uh, I, I, I got my college degree first, which took me a very long time because I, it turned out I had a number of learning disabilities that I had to overcome mm -hmm. that, that came up during college. Mm -hmm. I graduated from college. Um, I was going to the recruiting office. I didn't know what to do next and saw a cover of Inc. Magazine that had a picture of the lieutenant colonel with a dress blue uniform. And on the bottom it said, the best business management training program in America. <laughs> and I took the magazine and I walked into the recruiting office and I said, I want to do this. Uh, it just made sense. I was very active at the time and I liked the physical activity and I wasn't ready to join an office yet. So um, I went through the grueling uh, process of even getting accepted to the program. And then they flew me out to Quantico, Virginia, where I went through this officer candidate program for 10 weeks, which was probably one of the most difficult things I ever did in my life, and then followed by some six months of officer training. And I spent four years in that program oh. uh, gaining uh, self-discipline, confidence, um, planning, uh, strategy ability, mm. tactics, and it, it really... Um, made all the difference to me in life and in the business. It's lifelong. It's lifelong. Talk about a return on advertising spend. <laughs> I think I'd see the, the magazine, the INT magazine, spot on. <laughs> spot on. Okay, right. Um, so would you say they've been like major milestones to where you are now? And would you mind if, if you publicly share um, your revenue figures where you are now revenue wise? Sure, we're at about 22 million. We'll be at about 22 to 23 million in revenue by the end of this year. Not bad at all. Uh, yeah, not not too bad. We're happy with that revenue number. Absolutely. Uh, we'd like it to grow uh, bigger. And we, we actually, this year, we made a very big decision. Um, we started this business as a dropship business only. Wow. And in years, we, we pulled it, pulled back the percentage of revenue that was dropship. And in January of this year, we cut off the remaining 10 to 15 percent of our revenue that was was dropship revenue. Okay. And we've got 100 percent inventory. Okay. Fine time. It's been, a, it's been a real learning year for us mm. um, because managing inventory is very challenging. And so we've built our own um, ERP system over the years, and we've been adding a lot of features to uh, making sure that we control this asset, which is next to our people is probably the second most valuable asset that we have at Gazity. And it's been quite a learning and uh, it, it really is a transformation from the way we used to do business. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, let's talk about key milestones. Um, over the last, over 10 years, um, you started out as a dropship you know, site. Um, not many dropship sites survive eventually. There's fatigue. Um, how did you, go beyond selling, you know, um, basketball hoops. How did you initially expand? What did you expand to? When did you start becoming mature? And, you know, how did you get your first million? I know these are many questions, you know, and then, you know, how did you build up to here? Do, do you have any key milestones in, in, in the in the history of, of Audacity? Yeah, so there's so many milestones, Kunle. In 2002, when we started, we built a very basic website and uh, we, we were paying per click, and it was a nickel a click oh. back in those days, sometimes less. And uh, it, it was magnificent. In the first year, we did 100,000. The next year, we did a million. The following year, we did 2 million. Wow. Um, we, we doubled to 4 million the year after that. So we were literally doubling in size the first four years. And it was on the backs of this PPC. I, I forget the name. If, I, I get the names mixed up. I think it was Overture.com. Mm. This company to really do this pay-per-click stuff, even before Google AdWords yep. launched. And then I think Yahoo bought them. Yep. Uh, it was a bidding process. So... So, you know, 2002, and I think 2004 was another big milestone for us because we got this phone call from Amazon and they said, hey, we'd like you guys to sell basketball hoops and game tables on our website. Wow. And we said, yes, please. We didn't ask any questions. We said, yes, please, we'd like to do that. And uh, I always joke with people, but it's a true story. We were selling basketball hoops on Amazon before Amazon was selling basketball hoops. It's, it's, really hard, <laughs> it's hard to imagine that because they're, they have such a broad catalog now. Yeah. When they first called us, they were selling books and DVDs and yeah. music and all this media. So yeah. it, was a very big, um, it was a big day for us when we got that phone call. And we have been on the Amazon platform for a long time and we know it very well. Yeah, that was about the time. Very long part about business. 
Yeah, that's about the time, 2004, according to, to the book, um, the Amazon store, that's about the time Jeff made the decision to, to, to become a platform. And, and that just changed, you know, everything. It changed the game. You know, Amazon was, was playing, you know, on, which, which is amazing. You know, the fact that you're selling basketball hoops before, before Amazon. Okay, so four years, you know, 2x growth all through. Um, then, then, did it start to slow down um, or did you, you know, um, you know, figure out new ways to, to hack growth and co continue, you know, um, growing 2x or, you know, 1.5x? You know, in, in those days, in 2004, once you got to 4 million in revenue, the wheels were sort of falling off the cart mm. uh, because there was so much growth and we were such a small team. We really spent a lot of time developing our own software, and to this day, we run our business off of our own um, ERP system that uh, manages everything from our orders, our products, database, um, you know, customer service. We have a, a pretty intense financial reporting hmm. that allows us to drill down per SKU and per order the exact profit on each individual order. Uh, and we can zoom in and zoom out. And we, we did that because there was no really good SaaS software that was affordable at the time. Now, I mean, if I was starting from scratch today, I would use, there's there's a number, there's a dozen great SaaS What, what would you use for, for an ERP now? You know, um, as far as running an Amazon business or a marketplace business, you know, I would I would look to Skew Vault or Skew Bond on one of yeah. those guys. Yeah. Um, I think they have a very good product and it's always getting better. Um, but you know, we, if I was starting, we may also on the ERP side work with something like a Sage product or some, you know, some, some Oracle products that have become affordable on the okay. space. And um, so yeah, so that that's what we spent a, a number of years doing, is building out the capability so we would know where our money was coming in and coming out. At the same time, trying to be profitable, so maintaining your profitability. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You remember, we had some new talent with uh, Brother Josh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really High school <laughs> whiz. Extraordinary, extraordinary development. I was at Berkeley University when he was building up our ERP system okay. in his free time. Wow. He was doing a degree in something else. And so, uh, he's pretty incredible. And, and Elon is my other brother. Elon. He's still very much involved in the business. And okay. And his idea, actually, to launch into air hockey whose ball tables in, in uh, he, cause he had just gotten out of college okay. and had left the fraternity and said, Jason, every fraternity house has a pool table. <laughs> so that's how we got involved in the home rec business. Okay. 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 So, so what's the leadership like now? Your CEO, Josh's COO. What, what does Elon, what's, what's Elon? He, Elon is the CRO. He's our CR. Okay. We always joke that he's the chief relationship officer. <laughs> the line and all the vendors love talking to him. So, okay. Um, so we, you know, I, I'm a CEO, but I don't do anything without running it by them first. We've been okay. doing this together for so long that we really are. We do make consensus decisions, and we've learned over the years that if one of us says, "Ah, this isn't a good idea to move forward," then it's probably not. Mm. So we we always are in lockstep when we make our decisions. Uh, trifecta. Big strategy changes, etc. Like for example, the one we made this year to shut off all of the dropship business. Yeah. That was something that we talked about and whiteboarded again and again and again, and we all agreed that given the landscape and uh, wanting to future-proof our business, that putting all of our resources into developing our private people and um, getting away from dropship and man managing that inventory yep. so that our performance metrics with the customers so we can yep. deliver fast and free was really the only way forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I um, interviewed um, a gentleman by the name of um, Jason Laguerre. Um, um, he's who's doing like forty million dollars in um in in revenue and on Amazon, just Amazon. Um, and he was pretty much moving prior to that. He was just moving, um, you know, toys, stock, and then um, he made a decision to to kind of put a halt in that, and he concentrated on private labeling for more control because he was complaining about margins and about um the lack of um supply chain control. So he's, I think, the second biggest at the time um, supplier of um, costumes and and on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I just wonder where they are now because I I interviewed them like about a year and a half. Um, I'm sure they've they've made you know significant progress and you know as you said it's 
it's down to control, really. And um, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I honestly think Kunle, that the future of brands is going to start with Jason and companies like us. Mm. We have a different playbook than the big products companies of the past and present. Mm -hmm. And we learned this from launching products on websites like Amazon, like Walmart, like Jet, and some of the other um, websites. And we, we have this uh, saying with our products team, launch and learn. So we go, we go live with the product before we, before we uh, decide on designing and developing a new product, we first do a lot of research and we read all of the information that's out there. We read about the product reviews from competitive products. We look at the specs from competitive products. We look at the Q&A from competitive products, and we find out what customers are unhappy with mm. in current top sellers. And then we go through this process of determining whether we think we can improve that mousetrap. And if we can, then we'll move forward. And um, you know, many times the playbook for companies like Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson and these big boys is that they have these very talented design teams where they make up a product and then they put it in front of a consumer focus group and then they try to adapt it from there. But mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that that is the best model forward. And I think that the way so many of us scrappy Amazon sellers and e-commerce sellers have developed this new product, I think that we're the... Absolutely, because in in the age of of data, where where this data is readily available, you know, why take the risk? Why not sock all that information in, analyze it, and you know, um, as you said, execute. You know, if if you can improve on the mouse 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 trap, so I you know, one hundred percent. You know, in line with what you just said. Okay. Um, so, so where do you, you talked about um, Jet.com, Walmart, um, Amazon. Um, are you very active in marketplaces? We're, we're extremely active in marketplaces and okay. we're constantly adding new marketplaces. Okay. At the beginning of this year, we added uh, House, H O U Z Z dot com. Are they a marketplace? They're, they're remarkable. They're, uh, they're, they have exactly our customer demographic. Hmm. And they, do, they have a very huge following when it comes to customers buying. Things for their home. Are they an e com site or an a, or a, a they, are. they are now? They, they are an online marketplace. Yeah. Wow. I've, I've, I only, I, I've, I've known them as they come across as an interior design, you know, hub or platform, kind of like Pinterest, but I didn't realize that they, they, they actually sell. Yeah, okay, interesting. We get calls from designers all the time saying, uh, we, we, have a, we have an exclusive uh, brand that we import from France called Rene Pierre Foosball. Mm. So we get a lot of calls from designers asking us to specialize the color for the foosball. They're beautiful French artisan made like yep. foosball tables. And uh, we get a lot of calls from designers from that platform and others saying, we want to put a foosball in this room, can you make it bright yellow? <laughs> we will customize for them uh, uh, based on them finding us on you know, the house network. Well, which comes with a premium, uh, I, I suppose. Um, yeah. Rightfully so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, prior to, to to actually you know making this interview happen, um, I interacted with um, some some of your staff from the Philippines, and I, I recall you said you're making a trip to the Philippines, and um, we haven't really talked too much in detail about that. But um, what do you guys do in the Philippines? Obviously. You're probably not sourcing from the Philippines. I think it's more a resource center. How's how's that playing out? Um, could you expand a bit more? On uh, absolutely. We, our largest office is in Manila, and we wow. have our own uh, Dazzity entity and staff of 21 members as of last week. Wow. Um, and they do a lot of uh, back office work for us, including uh, product listings that we have a, a full design team for not only designing images for great product listings, but also helping us design new products, uh, look and feel in the product design category. Wow. Um, would they do some level of customer support, no, no phone support, but they, they are, are a, an invaluable piece of our customer support um, uh, team. And uh, let's see what else we're doing there. We even have a budding digital marketing team that we're spinning up there. Wow. Uh, so we do we do a lot of work 
in the Philippines with our very highly educated uh, staff who love the West um, yep. and uh, are, are highly motivated and they do a tremendous job for us. And we also pair those teams with um, experienced folks here in the United States. And many of our people here in the U.S. actually work from home. Okay. So we just, well, we just finished our, our like that. We, we do this semi-annually. <laughs> we all get together and we have a group of meetings and we have some have a good time together so we can see each other. But most of the time, our staff in the U.S. are working from home. I really it like that. Us, yeah, it really allows us to compete with the likes of Walmart and Amazon and the others who are able to lose money on the sale of a product, which we can't do. Yep, um, yep. So we have to be creative and we have to be um, you know, flexible in the way that we uh, put ourselves in market. Yeah, I like the fact that you're agile. You're a very agile business, even, you know, Though your 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 eight figures, you know, a lot of you know businesses, the moment they do, they, they even hit five million in revenue, um, they get the office, you know, the really big office, flashy office, you know, and and they're paying lease, they they they're they're investing in, in a ten year lease, you know, and you know when you could put it into developing products and you know being more agile in in the marketplace, um, just yeah, I have, it's interesting about, yeah, about the Marine Corps yes. You articulated exactly the way we built this business structure with flexibility in mind. Mm -hmm. so you can expand and contract easily mm -hmm. if necessary. Um, but one of the one of the life lessons that I learned from the Marine Corps is they have this concept called maneuver warfare. So one of the strengths of the Marine Corps, because it's a very small armed service, sure. to, the army. to the army, they're an elite. Yeah, exactly. So they have to be nimble and they have to be flexible. And they have to use their resources really, really wisely. That's so I like think that I pulled that from my marine training. I like that. We, we spend a lot of time trying to employ them in our jazz are, are there any are there any books you'd recommend to short circuit your your, your marine <laughs> mentality? <laughs> Just a mentality, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Maneuverability. <laughs> in, in, in the list of Marines, lawyers who've written some really good books on what they've learned in the Marines, but uh, maybe something I'll write about. No, it's 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 amazing because um I'm just actually thinking about it. You know, there there are small elites, you know, group of um you know of of the army, the the parts of the army, and um you know they go, they execute, and they deliver results. You know. And uh, very, very effectively being, being, being nimble and, and agile. Two questions with regards to um, outsourcing, not outsourcing, actually managing teams. Do you use like tools such as Slack um, to to communicate? What what do you use to 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 bring everybody together so they feel, you know, they're they 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 like a team, you know, despite you know working um in in, in very, you know working from home and in the Philippines, working across you know the the world really. Oh yeah, so so Slack has been invaluable to us. Mm. It doesn't work with our China office because the Chinese government doesn't allow it, often for American uh, software products. Right. Uh, but, we'll, but we'll use WeChat. Okay, we, we need to talk about your China office. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but certainly our office, uh, our, our, our main office in Calabasas, California, mm -hmm. work from the home workforce, yeah. we find Slack to be incredibly invaluable. Well, we also recently started using uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom.us, I believe is the product. Yep. And I really love it because it allows us to have FaceTime okay. uh, with our staff, and it's a really good interface. We also use Skype, okay. uh, which we're using now. Yeah, we are. Um, that's, that's been uh, incredibly helpful and valuable. We use a lot of uh, program management software like Trello boards. Okay. As well as uh, some of the 37 Signals software. Yep. Basecamp. Mm -hmm. Depending on the project, we'll use one or the other. And, um, you know, we make sure that every week, U.S. team, we have at least a Zoom or a Skype meeting so we can see each other eye to eye. And we also, the, the, the important piece with the remote workforce, in my opinion, and we've had great success with it, is we have these dancing retreats. Mm. So we will fly everyone in to a resort somewhere, we'll hang out for the week, we'll uh, spend time together, eating meals together, yeah. talking about business, talking about each other's families, and yeah. connecting in that way. And we try to do that at least once, sometimes twice a year. So that's been really invaluable to us as well. Um, 
So, you know, we, we miss that. We miss that connection uh, sometimes, but by having these guys do retreats, it really helps energize the whole team. Yeah. Get them in the same direction. Yeah. Not that they're not all the time, but it's, it's just something about that face, that, that live connection that uh, helps. I agree. And I suppose there might be breakouts, you know, uh, meetups from, you know, certain members, say, say the marketing team needs a device, you know, need, need to have a creative session. They probably just meet face to face sometimes, you know. Um, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Let's talk about this China office. Um, obviously, um, you've let loose of um, the drop shipping aspect of the business, which is terrific, you know, this year. Um, and you're, you're into your own label, your private label brand, which you're, you know, um, selling both across marketplaces and through your website. Um, how, what tips would you give to listeners? Because I know they're listeners who, you know, are building uh, mid-tier businesses, looking to scale to your level and um, they're, they're brick walled basically, um, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, um, having an operation in China. What would you recommend, you know, um, what did you experience? How did you start? Well, um Great, great questions, and we, we may need to do another podcast for these <laughs> because there's so much information to unpack. Right. Uh, not only our story to setting up our own office in China, but uh, you know, it, it's a very different culture. Um, it is. And, and it, it's, it's very hard, especially for a Westerner, to go into that culture and change their thinking. Um, you, and you really have to. You really have to change your thinking. So how we got started is we had a, we had a couple of uh, dropship vendors at the time, and um, you know, the, 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 you know the, the relationship kind of fell apart for one reason or another. We couldn't get them to deliver a time or whatever. And so we decided to replace that business with our own private label. We've been actually doing this probably, I've been going to China myself two or three times a year for about 13 years now. To Guangzhou? Do you go to Guangzhou or? I, 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 yeah, I fly into Hong Kong and I either take a car or a ferry across into Shenzhen. And, okay. Um, Dong, Dongguan. Like Dongguan, okay. Wow, okay. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff in, you know, the transformation that's happened in that South <laughs> It's ridiculous. Like it's remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> the dog one to me it looks like a, a budding Silicon Valley now. It is, so, yeah. The, the transformation has been. Uh, really uh, uh, yeah, I, I was in China a few months ago, and um, yeah, it's, it's a parallel universe. It's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a great laughs> It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, and the amount of development is just re ridiculous. The, the scale of, yeah. So I, I literally went into Hong Kong, not really knowing anyone, but made some friends. Uh, and this was 13 or 14 years ago. And uh, people that could get me in contact with some factories. And we started through a long, prolonged, painful, agonizing series of trial and error. <laughs> wow. We on the factories that we, we do now. Uh, one piece, one, one suggestion that I would make to, to the viewers in the right kind of factory mm -hmm. it's two things number one i have i have found that the factories that i develop long-term relationships are ones who are already manufacturing and delivering maybe sometimes even for my competitor into the u.s market or into the eu okay if they haven't already made produced products and delivered to the united states or the eu i found very little success with those factories because it's a it's a big ramp up for them to understand the culture and the difference in consumer requirements your practice and, essentially exactly yeah, yeah exactly um so that, that's number one the second thing is, is if you if you do decide on a factory and you have them do a product for you um that i, I would highly recommend Hiring a company like an AsiaInspection.com, yeah. which is a great QC company that's very affordable, to do a pre-shipment in in inspection of the goods, and uh, you can select how many, you can do a random pull from your from your goods that you're going to ship over, and you will find amazing things. You will find amazing defects, etc. And through that process of quality control. You could really work with developing the relationship with the Nanjing factory. Okay. And it, it will take it will take two to three years. Uh, the Chinese are a big believer 
the concept called one chi, which is a long-term relationship. I have found, even with rising prices of commodities in China, that I will get better pricing with a factory that I've been working with in three to five years than I did out of the gate, which is a little bit reverse of the way that the Westerners do it. The Westerner wants your business. So he's going to give you a better price today, and he's going to incrementally increase your price. It's a hook. It's a reverse. Wow. That was a very big learning curve for me. Interesting. My life started to get a lot easier after year three or four with the same factory. And really, internally, the joke, this is not fair to the Chinese factories, but the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. So sticking with the factory, even if they're making mistakes and working with them to correct those mistakes, is a much better tact in China than trying to start over with a new factory. How big are these mistakes and how difficult are they to rectify? They're very difficult. Before we found the company Asia Inspection, I mean, we're doing our own QC now because we have our own office, but before we found Asia Inspection, we realized that it's probably a good idea to QC before shipping. I'll give you one example that pops into mind. We had two full containers of product, which probably totaled about $80,000 U.S. dollars, into our warehouse in Los Angeles, and it was a folding leg product. It was a foosball table that had folding legs. The only problem was the folding legs only folded this far. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Two containers. Oh. And um, you know, we we employ now a large network of contractors. I mean, we have our product designers in the Manila office, but depending on if it's a new product line, we have contractors that we use for product design, also engineers who can help us with sampling and uh, um, testing, pre-testing product prior to production mm -hmm. is very important. <clears throat> and in situations where they'll send me a sample and it's perfect, and then production will go through, and I'm expecting my perfect sample to happen, and it's just not the case. So that, like I said, kind of, we can do another podcast. Podcast, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. I know last decade and a half almost. Um, and, and, you know, now, ironically, the cost of labor and materials is really increasing in China, and we now have a factory in Vietnam. So okay. Wow. And uh, we, we, we even have some factories in Europe. Uh, that we're okay. Some exclusive okay. Okay. So we really expanded the countries. We, we received a new product from Pakistan uh, wow. this year as well. So this is our first foray into Pakistan. Wow. Each, each country has its own intricacies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're a full fledged global company. <laughs> Round full <full-loop>. loop. <laughs> Fantastic. It's really great. You know, I, I was an ugly American when I started the process, and I couldn't understand why they couldn't think like me. The best lesson I ever learned is okay, this is their country, and you have to learn to be flexible to their. Put yourself in their shoes and try to understand mm. their point of view. And the minute that happened, and it took me five years to learn that hard lesson, the minute that happened, my life got so much easier as it related to working in other countries, etc. So, Fantastic. Um, I've come a long way. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really wish we're running out of time, but, but you know, I, I've enjoyed every second of this conversation. Um, one question I to ask before I, you know, let you go, before we get into the evergreen questions is... Um, you know, we talked about Amazon and marketplaces. What would you advise? Um, what steps? So let's take take you several years behind. Hold on one second. Okay, let's take it one, you know, several years, you know, let's go several years back. Um, if you are to do Amazon again and marketplaces, for those, you know, of our listeners who are looking to, to get into, you know, um, marketplaces, how would you do it effectively now? Rapidly as they get bigger and bigger and apply more resources to the marketplace. Um, I, we really, at this point, have a blood relationship with Amazon. 
And, uh, you know, we realized that it's a tremendous market that owns half of the online market share in the United States. Um, and yeah. And we in Canada and the EU. Um, so we have to be on the platform. I think if you're just getting started, and this is a big nut to crack, if you're just getting started on the Amazon platform, I would highly recommend coming up with your own private label product. Yeah. There's just no future in selling other people's stuff on the online marketplaces. Across the board. <laughs> it's just, there's too much downward pressure on price. Yep. There, it's too competitive. Uh, if you're selling something that someone else is, it's, there are some times where there's 60 to 80 other sellers. We've had, we've had products in the toy category where there are 120 other sellers selling the exact same thing. How, how do you manage? What do you do? How do you move your stock in such situations? You know, um, th this is a problem I'm, 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 I, I have with, with Amazon. It seems like it's, it's a race to the bottom. It commoditizes, it puts lots of entrepreneurs against each other. You know, they're chasing, you know, the, the same market, the same consumers. It seems like it's allowing a glut of products, you know, into the market that are not ne necessary. And yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts in, you know, on, on, on Amazon and um, the fact that they own 50%, you know, market share in the States? It's, it's almost similar here in the UK. Um, where, how do you thrive? You know, you guys are thriving. You know, how, how are you guys bucking the trend? You know, Kunle, this is our third podcast we're going to have to do together because All right. <laughs> I'm mocking that down. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of tools that we have learned through trial and error and through a good close network of other big Amazon sellers. And there are some tricks of the trade. Uh, one of the frustrations that I'm hearing among my other, I call them colleagues, other Amazon sellers, is that you know a lot of the tools that we've used to employ in the past are being taken away from us. Mm. And um, you know, but but at the same time, they are giving us new tools. So we have a brand registered brand. Harville is our private label, H E R V I L. Okay. And because we're brand registered, we have complete control over our listings. And now we can do what used to be called A-plus details pages. They call them enhanced brand content pages. So that allows us to not only talk about the product in great detail, but offer additional imagery. We add infographics to the images so okay. that the customer can see visually the, the features and benefits of each given item. And then it also gives us a little bit of a, a splash screen to talk about our brand, it's powerful, and why, why it's special. And, and so because we have private label products and we own the SKU and we're not currently allowing others to sell that brand, at least not yet, um, then we find that that's a tremendous boost. Um, you, you have to uh, you know, also manage product review, which is a critical piece of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. The craziest thing that we do is drive off Amazon traffic onto our Amazon listings. Okay. From and social media? It goes in from social media, we're, we're considering doing it uh, also with some email lists. Uh, it really goes against the grain of building your own e-commerce site. I mean, if you have customers, you want to drive them to your site, but we found that it gives a tremendous algorithm boost to driving traffic. Now, back to your original question, how can you do it selling other people's stuff? You really can't. You can't be in control of the listing unless you work with a vendor that gives you brand registry. Like I mentioned, uh, Rene Pierre foosball table. It's mm -hmm. a, a beautiful French table that we, we have exclusive North American selling rights. Yep. So we have we are brand registered and we make those BPC pages for them. But if everyone else was allowed to sell that as well, we would have no control of the product listings. Gotcha. And we never stop working on those product listings. I, we joke in house that they should be assets on the balance sheet mm. um, because those listings were, were constantly tweaking we're listening to what the customer's telling us about the product and asking us about the product. We're, we're adding those that, that bit of information. We're tweaking our imagery. We're treat, tweaking the keywords used to describe that product mm -hmm. because those things change every quarter, every half a year. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we made the decision in January to get rid of the dropship because if we're selling other people's stuff, it's, it's just there's just no control. And we have no control. So this way, we have, we get to engage in a relationship with the customer, letting them, um, you know, ask us questions about the product that we can then go back and answer on the product listing. 
Um, and it just gives us so much more control of our own destiny. And Amazon will reward you if you have a, a fast growing, popular private label brand. They also, I think, see uh, the future there. And, you know, you're also competing against, against Amazon retail who will go out and yeah. buy your stuff. Yeah. And they sometimes ask you for invoices. They could take your listing offline and say, yeah, how did you get this? You know, we're trying to run, we're trying to validate a test. You know, could you send us supplier invoices? And you're wondering, hmm, what do they need supplier invoices, you know, for, for, for uh, to reinstate? I have, I have a weekly call with my friends that are also Amazon sellers in non-competing areas. Mm-hmm. Some of them crying on the phone because... They just don't have time to run their business anymore because they're getting up invoices and even the invoices get rejected at times. Mm. Uh, and my, I say the same thing to them. You know, private label, start your own label. It's the only future on the online market, mm. specifically Amazon. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I suspect that that's the way that it will go with the other online marketplaces, yep. like Sears and Jet Walmart as well. But, so two things I, I I picked up. One were was like the the barrier to entry. Um, one is barrier to entry. Um, you have a very high barrier to entry. You you you, you have things that um are not necessarily classified as small packets. Um, it's my son, um, Tommy. <laughs> Say hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll see you later. <laughs> Is Tommy. Um, <laughs> I can't stop him. He likes my whiteboard. But um, yeah, so you have high barriers to entry um, with, you know, and you listen to your customers. That's that's what I picked up from, from your um, from, from your Amazon um, from, from your Amazon strategy. And it seems to be really working, you know, um, 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 well. Right. It's, it's, it's the secret sauce. Nice. Um, yeah. Calls from those customers as well. So, we okay, like, you know, we we call them Marine Corps boots on the ground information. Uh, okay, from our customers on what to do to make this product better for them in the future. Okay, and uh, we've even had situations, and we do this constantly. If a customer leaves a bad review, we'll call them. Wow. Uh, if we can, if we can find them, we'll have a conversation with them. We'll make the change to the product, and the next time that product lands, we'll send them a new one free of charge. Okay, we want every customer to be happy. So we're a little bit crazy and obsessed about trying to make a product that the customer will literally fall in love Cost with like what they know about it. Fantastic, fantastic. And the other thing I picked up from what you just said was um, your mastermind calls. You may not call them mastermind calls, but they, they are mastermind calls with you know other similarly minded people who are non competing with you that uh, share all the information. How important has that been to going to Zaddy? You know, it's it's been it's been tremendous because. Mm. Uh, we, I, I just had breakfast with a, a big seller, much larger than I am, here in Seattle, uh, media, last last Friday, and um, we share our struggles and we share some of our our successes and failures, and and together we we really it, it really is helpful. It really is a, a helpful communication, and I've been very fortunate and lucky. You know, I've had some speaking engagements where. Uh, after the speaking engagement, people will come up and ask me questions, and I develop relationships in that mm. way. Um, and then also, people I've been on panels, discussion panels, where I've become friends with people on the panel. And it, 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 we have sort of this camaraderie together and the shared sense of pain and agony. And also, it's nice when we can share successes together as well. Fantastic, 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 Jason. Um, it's it's been amazing. It's been fantastic actually having you on. Um, and yeah, I'm. I'm super. I'm. I'm actually excited to get into the next um, round, which is a lightning round, where I ask you five questions, um, and yeah, if you could answer them with a single answer, it'd be fantastic. It'd be great. I'll do my best. All right. How do you hire people? We have a list of questions that I affectionately call the crazy questions. Okay. And it helps us identify. I, I borrowed from a book. Uh, uh, and his name escapes me right now, but he, he's a guy that wrote the book for the Secret Service on how to um, interview or, and, and screen threats to the president. Well, okay. I ask, I ask a version of those questions, and I get the crazy out. We have the best we have the people because they're all focused on team, the team. They're they're not narcissistic. 
they're incredibly hard workers mm. they value and love what we're doing so I ask the crazy questions that's how I know people fantastic good stuff um, what are your three indispensable tools for managing your business well because we have so much remote workers uh, both here in the US and then we have the offices in China well I can't use Slack in China but Slack is, is, is absolutely critical to our business mm. The, um, the second piece of software that we love is, is the Trello boards and a lot of the pro- project manager. We talked about that a little bit earlier. The third thing is that's completely indispensable is our own ERP system. It okay. works really, really well for exactly our businesses, um, and uh, we, we just couldn't do it without it. I don't think we could start today building it from scratch, but we've been lucky uh, to build a really awesome platform over the last 16 years. You're on big commerce, right? Uh, oh, commerce yes. Yeah. And um, how, how does big commerce work with your ERP? So we have an API connection yep. uh, with the big commerce front end, and we went through an exhaustive search uh, to find a front end service because it's really not our strength in software, it is the front end. And we talked to everyone. We talked to Magento, we talked to, um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the guys from Canada, um, but we found BigCommerce to be the absolute best platform out there. Uh, we call them the grown-up platform. Everyone else is kind of dancing on the fringes, mm. um, but they're the only ones that allow us to do the things that we need in order to run our business. Mm. I was going to ask earlier um, what the share of um, you know um, front <clears throat> like website to marketplace business looks like you know at the moment, but but that totally crossed my mind. What do, do you mind sharing? Sure, we we have. 30- percent of our total business goes through our own website. It's okay. a fast growing segment. Mm-hmm. The lion's share of our business is really in the online marketplaces. Okay. And Amazon's the largest portion of that. If you add up all of the others together, it still doesn't hold the candle to the Amazon yeah. side of the business. But they're growing fast and they're catching up. Do you do international with, with Amazon? We just launched in Canada yep. in Amazon. We have set up our own entity in the EU, so we're coming in okay, to the US soon. Uh, <laughs> we realized after a visit to the EU that we have a lot of homework to do before we launch there. Yeah, that's this VAT, which which is big, big yeah. one. But um, yeah. yeah, once once I heard that it's crossed, it's it's smooth sailing. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay. What has been your best mistake to date? By that I mean a setback that's giving you the biggest feedback. Oh my gosh, come on. It's a curveball. I've had so many great mistakes over the years. We have a lot of stars. <laughs> um, you know, we talked about some of them in the interview, but I, I, I think that uh, the, the biggest mistake we've ever made is the mistake to go after market share in spite of profits. Hmm. And we don't have the ability like Amazon to sell stock for $1,000 a share to make up for lost profits on a hmm. We can't do it. We don't have loss leaders for the most part, um, unless it's a closeout item that, that was a miss by our buyers. But we are not in the online market share business. We are in the online sales for profit business. Yeah. And we got away from that in 2013. And it cost us a million dollars that year. We had a million dollar loss. Ouch. And it was, the, it was the most painful, but also most lasting uh, lesson that we've learned. And, and that preempted us in our ERP system to build the reporting that takes us down to the SKU level and down to the order level and, and combines all of our costs so we know exactly if we're making money. Yet. So you understand your profitability, your profitability to, 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 to the product level. Every single sale you make, you understand what the margins are in real time through yeah, the ERP. Order level, but also the order level. Order level. Nice, mm-hmm. nice. Great stuff, great stuff. Okay, final question. Um, if you could choose one single book or resource that's made the highest impact on how you view building a business and growth, which would it be? You know, the book that convinced me, I read this book while I was still in the Marine Corps. Okay. That convinced me that I wanted to go, instead of the corporate America path, I wanted to go the entrepreneur path, was uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad. Oh, nice. Okay. That's... Um, for those listeners out there who are thinking about starting their own business and haven't taken the plunge, I highly recommend that book. Um, it, it, it was very enlightening and it, and, it, and it put me on my path towards entrepreneurship. Knowledge. Fantastic. It's, it's, it's been a recurring you know, recommendation from, from several guests. Jason, how can I thank you enough? It's been an insightful, it's been, it, it's been like a marathon at the same time as sprints <laughs> over this past hour. Um, 
It, it is indeed. It is indeed. Um, and I'll take on your offer with regards to, um, you know, subsequent interviews around outsourcing and marketplaces, you know, in a good time. But it's thank you so much. I've learned masses. I would, you know, follow up with questions via email to you if that's okay, given your heavy schedule. But thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Cheers.